right, we're live. We're First Impressions, the podcast where we talk about our love for Jane Austen and give a big middle finger to all the haters. I am Kristen, and I'm joined today by Maggie. Hi. Hey, welcome back to the podcast. Good to be back. <laughs> so you're married now. I am. I'm much wiser now. Exciting times. You I had your very own know. happy ending. Is it a happy ending or is it a happy <laughs> beginning. Oh, I love that. Oh, okay. Wonderful. <laughs> well, it was a beautiful wedding. Everybody had a blast and everyone except us. Cause we were just running around the whole time. Oh, yeah. Actually taking pictures afterwards. Um, Bay and I were saying we took a, a week off and went down to the Outer Banks and just tried to chill. And we were saying that was a really fun wedding. I would have loved to have been a guest. <laughs> <laughs> it was so fun. It was one of the most. Well, I was um, I had had a few of the Fizzy Bennett cocktails that were the specialty <laughs> cocktails, which is adorable. They had grenadine in them. But anyway, it had more than a few Fizzy Bennett's. And the I went up to the wedding photographer like earlier on in the day when everybody was dancing, like, you know, like right early on in the dance floor times. And I walked up up to him and I was like, is this the funnest wedding you've ever been to? (laughs) Well, he did come up to me. The DJ came up to me at the uh, cocktail hour and whispered in my ear, that was the best bridal march I've ever seen. And I'm including my own wedding. And it's because we used the throne room music from the end of Star Wars episode four (laughs) and timed it. And he's a big nerd like we are. So he really likes that. (laughs) Everybody laughed so much when they heard the music. So it was so cute. I mean, it was still like the big, here's the broad moment, but it's also like, ha ha, this is amazing. Which is sort of your brand. Yeah, that's my brand. So what did the uh, <laughs> photographer say? Oh, yes. I went up to him the first time. I was like, this is the funnest wedding ever, right? And he w- he's like, they all are. They all are. And I, oh, I, was, no. I was secretly like, you know. So later, I, got, I, w- I had had a few more Fizzy Bennett's. And I went up to him again when, like, during the Don't Stop Believing final dance epic extravaganza. <laughs> and I just ran by him. And I was like, funnest wedding ever. And he just <laughs> sort of rolled his eyes at me. <laughs> <laughs> well, but, I do have to thank Kristen because she gave the most beautiful toast. And do you know, I did not cry at all, like during the ceremony, nothing during the reception, except for your toast at the end. I got a little teared up. It was oh, so man. Beautiful. So did I. It was so it was just everything was perfect. It was perfect wedding for if from a guest perspective. I'm sorry you had to take all the photos and like miss all the fun dancing but I the the DJ did um like extend the last dance because they someone had to go run and find you in bass so you could dance the last song at your own wedding and he like did the cool thing where he like extended it until you guys get on the dance floor it was awkward because I was dancing with Kevin's friend so Kevin got food poisoning and was unable to join me at the wedding so I was I was stag at your wedding and Kevin's friend, who also came, Tony, was like, oh, we'll dance for the last song since you're, you know, alone. But then it was this epic extended dance mix. So it was just him and, him and me dancing forever. Who's also Mary. It's like yeah. awkward. He's, and her wife was like on the sidelines. Like she had graciously allowed him to not dance with her. And I was Chuck also like, oh. nightly dances with Harriet. <laughs> oh, my God. Yes. Um, nightly. Nightly. She calls him nightly. She's never even seen him before. I don't even call him that. So this, so we are, believe it or not, eventually going to start talking about Emma uh, on this podcast. We watched the Romola Garay, what is it, 2008, 2009? 2009, I believe. 2009 adaptation of Emma and with Johnny Lee Miller as Mr. Knightley. And it, we have some thoughts. Okay, so I saw this back when it came out. And yeah, I remember, didn't we watch it together? I don't know, possibly. I don't we watch a lot of things together. <laughs> um, I'm pretty sure that what happened is Master BBC made all of these new adaptations and Masterpiece Theater showed them. So we probably did watch this together, but I remember not liking it at all. Oh, and, at all. Yeah, at all. Like such that this rewatching of it is only the second time I have ever seen it. Oh. And I was so wrong. Oh my God. I, I have done a complete 180. And by the end of the fourth, I mean, we have some thoughts, but by the end of the fourth episode, I was crying with joy. I was like, it's so beautiful. Aww. And I like, I was, I was all, all in. 
And and you I you kind of you liked it too, especially the last two episodes, right? I also have made your thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> I did not particularly like the first two episodes of the four. It is for one hour, but I really liked the last two. So the so first half, eh, the second half, great. So let's probe that. Why overall do you think you think you were still growing into it? Um, or? I have a lot of several of my issues with it are in terms of choices, storytelling choices. And then I also have some character choices, which mm-hmm. I do not blame the actors for. I think this is what the creators were going for. If you want, I can tell you specifically yeah. now. Yeah, yeah, specifically. Uh, storytelling issues I have with it are first, they clearly needed to extend it. So they created this extended prologue, which sets up, you know, who everybody is, how they're related, Emma's sister and her mother passing away, explaining why their dad is the way he is. And they talk about Harriet, or no, I'm sorry, they talk about Jane Fairfax and how, why she had to leave. Then they talk about Frank Churchill and why he had to leave. Anyway, they set up all of this prologue information with a narrator. Mm. And we never see the narrator again. No, and at one point I made a note, like, why is the narrator male? I thought that was a yeah. really interesting they choice. They a male narrator who they're trying to draw connections between these three kids, right? Emma, Jane Fairfax and Frank Church. In kind of a heavy-handed way. I was like, okay, I see where they're going. I see they're taking a tack here. I found it completely unnecessary. I found it very distracting. So if you're going to do something like that, I thought, okay, well, maybe this will come back at the end. Uh, it did not. <laughs> so we never saw the narrator again, never heard anything about that. There were no more flash, nothing like that. So I had a big problem with that structurally. I, th- I just think it's lazy storytelling. This is all information that can be provided through, say, like dialogue, exposition dialogue. I took it as that these characters, like Frank uh, especially, comes in sort of after some of the main action of the first. So I I took it as this is for people who've never read the book. We're going to be throwing some characters at you later. So we want you to have an initial sort of orientation and also giving them a clue that Frank and Jane, even though they may seem peripheral, are going to be important. Um, but I also didn't, I also was felt that it was being imposed on me, I guess you would say. Yeah, I, I don't disagree with that. I could see a producer or like someone from BBC being like, hey, like this is kind of confusing. There's a lot of characters. Who are these people? It's lazy story. It's lazy writing, in my opinion. And whether that's someone underestimating the audience or f- the initial script wasn't, cl- you know, it's not mm-hmm. necessary. The other issue I had, okay, we started off with this like omniscient narrator explaining what's going on. Then in episode, I think it's episode two, but it might even be episode three. We start with an Emma interior monologue Mm. from out of nowhere. There's voiceover. It's not in the first episode. It may not be in the second episode. I'd have to go back. But all of a sudden we get Emma's interior monologue And again, very jarring. It does not have storytelling consistency. I don't, I don't want to say it wasn't necessary because maybe it is. I think in the Gwyneth Paltrow version, they do have it as well. She's like writing in her journal or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And that's fine. But if you're going to do it, do it. That having been said, yeah, it totally makes sense. Uh, That having been said, and I'm sure you, you were agree, you agree with it, but with what I'm about to say too, I will flip it around and say that, They did have a number of her internal thoughts, um, not monologue necessarily, but narrated over uh, at certain times, especially when she's having an emotional sort of uh, thing that we we would never have been able to pick up on her feelings, her exact feelings otherwise, that I actually really started to appreciate. They also did some imaginings um, in her head how things are which they also sort of used in the Beckinsale Emma as well, which I didn't like there, but I did like it here because they were hysterical. It's sort of the same um, technique that Andrew Davies used in the Northanger Abbey adaptation where Catherine's Catherine's imagination is overheated, you know, and thinking of all these Gothic things. They did this uh, too with Emma where she imagines Frank rescuing Harriet from the gypsies or she imagines, I have some other notes about, Oh, Mr. oh Dick, Dixon. Mr. Dixon, yeah, and Jane in these romantic situations. And it was so well done, I think, because it shows us 
the youngness, the unsureness, the naivety of Emma. And especially in the ball where she's standing there and she's waiting for Frank Churchill to appear. And she thinks, is this how it should be? You know, is this all how it should be? Am I in love? And um, I absolutely loved the the youthfulness that that imbued her character with. Because that's, that's something that's so different than in the Gwyneth Emma, which I, I had to learn to let go of. We, we always talk about, you know, you imprint on your first version. And for I don't know why, but for me, I imprinted on the Gwyneth Emma so strongly. And looking at this version, I think one of the reasons I didn't like it at first, and I was wrong not to like it, is because the beats are different and the characters are more dramatized, more fleshed out, more weighty and given. Whereas I love to think this, think of this as just a frilly, fluffy comedy like Northanger Abbey, because that's the way it seemed to me, because the Gwyneth one's so funny. And then this is even better from an artistic standpoint. And I wasn't appreciating that. Where I figured out what they were doing and when I really started liking it. So, okay. So I mentioned there's a couple things. I I agree with you about her fantasies. I really liked that. I just wish those had also been employed. I guess I can only think of two instances they really done it. I think we could have used more of those. In fact, the information that they got across through the narrator could have been told to the audience through Emma's imaginings. Like when someone mentions Frank Churchill, she could be like, oh, Frank Churchill, you know, he was that young boy who was whisked away. (laughs) Yeah. Um, So it's kind of like, let's choose which one of these storytelling devices we're going to use. Okay. That is one of my main critiques. When I really started loving this, and I think when I understood what they were saying was actually the scene in the ball. When she walks in to, what is it, the crown? Mm -hmm. And... I mean, it's okay. Like they've got some lights up and like it's, and, but she and everyone else are just like, it's magical. It's a fairy tale. Yeah. And I was like, okay, I understand now what they're doing. They are working really hard to differentiate from the Gwyneth Paltrow version by making Highbury and Emma very much more provincial than they were in the movie. In the movie, you could not imagine that Emma saying, I've never been to a ball. Yeah. I mean, she looked like they threw balls on the reg. Like, (laughs) they were really rich. Like, they wanted that to, she was very moneyed, very clearly moneyed. This Emma, their house is stunning. They've got grounds, everything like this. Girlfriend's never been to a ball. Girlfriend's never been more than like five miles from home. Yes, they really emphasized that, didn't they? they, sh- they she's never been to the seaside, even she's Box never Hill. Traveled. Yeah, you've never Fox, traveled. Yeah. Even Box Hill is like a huge new thing for her to experience. And then, you know, when they go to the seaside, I loved that they kept that in. And it made me think back to Tash, our listener who came on the Clueless podcast with us talking about Emma never traveling. And that was like her very stationary characteristic. They used that also to show a hole in Emma's life. And and here is what I thought too, not to get like too down, too much down bunny holes, but you get so much more of the sense that Emma has missed out on life that when she does imagine Mr. Dixon being in love with Jane Fairfax, I kind of took that as she was feeling left out of the whole thing and wanted to feel smarter than everybody else. You know, like she wanted to elevate herself being like, I I know all these people's secrets. Yeah, I wasn't at Weymouth, but I'm smart enough to be able to even diagnose their human condition from afar. And so that, that kind of just, I kind of wondered when she had that imagining that she was like, maybe she was just letting her imagination run away with itself. But I I kind of took that as a a compensation of her not being there and having those experiences. Um, Once I figured that out, what they were doing, the distinctions they were drawing and kind of what they were doing with the character, I enjoyed it a lot more. I also enjoyed it a lot more from that. Well, I guess I would say like from the point where Mr. Elton proposes and she freaks out, that is when I actually started liking her. Um, we can get into her specific character later. One of the things, though, that really bothered me about the first you know, two episodes of this is I did not like Emma. I always liked her in the book. Even, yeah, she's spoiled and, you know, she's selfish. and But she never seemed like just being mean. And I, ugh, I don't know. I just did not like her character in the first two episodes. When she started growing... 
then I really liked her. I just wish we could have started more. And let me say, I loved the actress. I thought she did a great job. This is clearly the vision of the writers and the directors and the, you know, this is like what they were doing with it. I thought she did a fine job. I also have the same thing in my notes that, but I put this as Ramona Garay's, like she, at the beginning, she's playing a line between young and old that you sort of see when they have their, uh, Knightley and Emma have their first big fight scene. They have a very serious fight and um, he comes back and she turns around and she bursts out. I'm so glad you've come back. And she seems yeah. so young girl and so childlike. And, and that really forcibly struck me and her, his illusion, this big fight scene, I didn't, I didn't like, I thought that he needed to hold back more because honestly he was very dislikable in this scene. But really, one thing she dislikable they were both kind of dislikable and it went on for way too long but one thing they did do which was clever was that they they ref he uh nightly referenced um her playing with the bride and groom set of dolls mm -hmm. and that even draw, drew home the childishness of her or how he still saw her as like a young girl playing with dolls when he he has to lecture these are not your dolls anymore emma you know, but that's one of the reasons why I really disliked her. Oh yeah, um, for these first two episodes. For example, when she, when night, when her sister. Let me see. It opens with there is a wedding. It's her sister marrying his brother. Right? Isn't that the first wedding we see? Mm. She's and she's like, I knew it would happen. I said that they would get together. Well, that's right. Yeah, that's right. She's sitting in the pews, and she says, she says, who who should be my next? Oh, Who yeah. should I set it next? And then she's actively looking around <laughs> and she sees Mr. Weston yes. looking at Miss Taylor. Taylor. And it's like, ooh. And I hated that because <laughs> <sighs> Emma's meddling in the novel to me came out of her wanting her friends to be happy. It was good natured. This was like, I'm bored. Oh, Whose yeah. lives can I tinker with as the puppet master? You know, but she's clearly <laughs> not a good puppet master. But right. it was just like, oh, I'm so bored. What should I do? Oh, I'll fuck with everybody. <laughs> and well, it just came off as so mean girl to me. And I just really didn't like it. It's a good point you make, too, because in the actual narrative of the book, by the time Miss Taylor and Mr. Weston do get married, uh, her sister's already had like three kids. So yeah, she's got five kids by the time we're in the. <laughs> so making it, doing this artificial thing where Emma's like, I'm going to do another one is um, both makes her seem like, you know, t way too childish to understand that these are people with feelings, but also doesn't necessarily really fit. But I kind of see what they were, they were, what they were doing. And, and um I actually thought they were really hard on Emma being like, oh, Emma, you did this. Now you have to be sad. You know, no, of course she wants her governess and best friend to get married to a wealthy man who can give her a good life. In the book, that's clear that she just wants a good life for her governess. In the movie, they kind of made it an outcropping of her selfish sort of meddling, having a negative effect on her. So yeah, it made her seem even younger and sort of less considerate than Emma is in the book. But later, but they, once, they do give her more depth than in the book. Once she just blows it so completely with Harriet, so completely, and Elton oh, yeah. proposes to her. From that point on, we start to see actual character growth. And then I was much more on board. And after the, from the scene of the ball on, I really enjoyed it. Coincidentally, that's when she, and I did like how they did this. That's when she starts seeing Knightley as like an object of sexual and romantic and like affection. They did a fantastic job with the dancing at the ball. I agree. You know? and, and they did not do like this very formal Mr. Beverage's maggot, you know, the same sexy song that is in all of the, like the one sexy country dance. It was um, a country doll. <laughs> they kept some of the moves from it, I noticed, but they did a different um, thing and, and they made it uh, very like, very young love, like for her, this sort of luminous quality where they're gazing into each other's eyes and she's feeling like a new feeling, you know? And, and what I liked about it is he too sort of has a flashback later where he's in, you know, Donwell Abbey or someplace and he's looking forward and he, he sees her, the face d dancing. So, you know, that this was an important experience for both of them, but they did not try to force it into something sexy that it wasn't. Yeah. 
And that, that is one criticism I have of the Gwyneth Emma is I love when Knightley dances with Harriet in the Gwyneth Emma. I really hate when they dance with each other and they do this weirdly sexualized Mr. Beveridge's neck. And I'm like, no, no, this is all wrong for them. This is all, but anyway, not to talk about that. Um, I do wish that um, I, I do. There's nothing more that there's no more favorite scene for me than in the Gwyneth Emma where you don't know who's asking Harriet to dance. And then they come to the top of the line and it's Knightley and Harriet and the yeah, music and the swells music picks up, and you yeah. just feel like, isn't this wonderful? And, and Emma looks so happy. Yeah. And they kind of do the same thing here, but you don't get the same massive emotional punch, but that's okay. I mean, that's okay. That's all right. So we, I think we did a, did a good job talking about Emma as character and, and um, the actress. And I hope I'm saying her name right, Romola. I, I don't know if it's like Romola or something. but I, I think it is Romola. Oh, I have Romola. to tell you. So um, Bay's review of this, he came in while I was watching. I think I was on the end of episode three. He came home while I was watching it. He looks at the screen and he, sa- and he says, what is this? And I said, oh, it's Emma. And he said... I don't like her. <laughs> and I said, what are you talking about? And he said, let me tell you, there's only one good Emma. And do you know who it is? And I said, Gwyneth Paltrow. And he goes, no, it's Alicia Silverstone. Uh, <laughs> He's a babe. And then he walked out of the room. <laughs> <laughs> but and I have to say, and we'll just stop and say something totally superficial. God, she is beautiful. And God, the costumes are beautiful. I yes. have a, a running like live blog that I took for myself just in a Word document when I was watching this so I could make notes later. And there are like three different comments like, oh my God, she looks gorgeous right here. And um, it's- The it, it, wispy hairs that are always like blowing in the breeze. Oh man, and those blouses that she actually dresses very conservatively and looks like a, a young girl in that, in that she's so modest in her daytime dress with those blouses that sort of cover everything everything yeah. but she looks gorgeous anyway I will um, say they did also say I said what are you talking about she's beautiful when he was talking about Alicia Silver and I he said she is but she's very modern looking her face oh and I said what do you mean he's like well she's not as like pinchy <laughs> <laughs> um but she is clearly he did not believe that she was actually British he's like she looks American um I don't know wow. if that's true or not. I think she's lovely, and I don't. Oh, see yeah. how. I don't know, but that, I mean, uh, that's what they make some notes about the costume. That, that's, the, that's the complaint I had about Johnny Lee Miller, and I know I said this on. Oh, okay, it's fine, Kristen. No, it's okay. It, you're right. It's fair. You're right. In the beginning, that really did bother me. By the end, he had come to inhabit the character of Knightley. The problem that we have, especially when we've read the book and we've already seen one movie adaptation that we liked, is that those people are so fixed in our minds. And then we have to allow a different actor to start to inhabit that character. Okay, this I, is the problem. You have way more than I do. I do. I do. But but part of the thing that ha- kept me from stepping through the veil was that he just doesn't look to me to me, but that's my limitation. And, and, and it's a testament to him, his strength as an actor that he did get me past all that by the end. The thing is though, that, and here's the thing about me. I actually am very embarrassed about this, but I, I love the, the story where the man is mean and then the woman wins him over like the, I, I, you know what I'm saying? Like the trope, yeah, yeah. like the Edwin yeah. Cullen, like the with, withdrawn, you know, withholding man that starts to Ooh. come out of his shell. And that's what Knightley is, right? Like he's always lecturing her and you always kind of feel like he's mean or like an enemy or like being, being unnecessarily harsh. Normally I would be totally on board with this relationship because I have a, pro- I have this problem, right? Um, but normally I'd be totally on board. Oh, I'm in love with Knightley. Oh, I wish I could make Knightley like me. That would be such an achievement. I would validate me, right? Um, but I just didn't want to make him like me. He seemed like a small, mean person. He has a way of setting his mouth so that it's this tiny line, you know, and it's not at all like mean, sexy. It's just mean, <laughs> mean. Oh, I don't know. I really, I, okay, I have so many thoughts. Um, no, no, no. One more thing I want to say, though, is oh, that... Okay. Jeremy Northam does a good scold that is gentlemanly. 
So the thing with this is if you're going to believe someone is a Regency gentleman, they have a certain standard of behavior. They, I mean, they can't raise their voice necessarily. It's not gentlemanly. Donnie Lee Miller, and this is probably true of the character of Knightley. I mean, as we see, he does. He walks. He doesn't ride his carriage. Whatever. He doesn't care about being gentlemanly, and he's not. He doesn't seem gentlemanly, and that's why I I still go back to Jeremy Northam as like the ideal. However, I understood what he was doing and I bought into what he was doing, especially by the end. He's his own person. As he says, you know, like I might be able to talk about it more, but I, I'm, you know what I am. And by the end, I did know what he was. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Uh, first of all, I really liked Johnny Lee Miller. One of our listeners pointed out that he is kind of losing his hair. So he probably didn't have a lot. <laughs> I don't mean to be out. hard on him. I'm just saying um, I thought he was really good. I don't know. Um, he was good. He was good. In the fight, the like badly done Emma scene, I thought he was good. I don't know. I didn't have any issues with him like you did. By the end, I was totally on board uh, with him and Emma. So let me just get back to your saying like that you really like this trope, but you were beating yourself up for it. And Kristen, that's not what we do here. <laughs> mm, and acknowledge, I mean, this whole podcast is about not apologizing for yeah. liking Jane Austen. So That's here's the true. thing. You can, you're allowed to like whatever you like. Thank and you. You don't have to apologize for it. And if you want to recognize the problematic aspects, that's good. We should, right? right. Like this idea that you can change a quote, like bad boy is <laughs> like super, can be very harmful, right? Yes. yes. If you recognize it as being problematic and you're like, but you know what? It's just what I enjoy. Or if I loved Disney princess movies and I recognize that a lot of them don't get any agency, but I still am a sucker for it. You know, yeah, whatever yeah. your thing is. Yeah. You can have we to can't apologize. Help it. We can't but help don't it. You, don't you talk bad about yourself for liking that trip. Well, I think I there's like a million romance novels that use that and people love them. And it's Oh, it's so true. But I got a public smackdown on a, a forum once talking about how I loved this book, Naomi Novik's Uprooted, where this young girl falls in love with this 200 year old wizard who's really mean to her in the same kind of trope and eventually comes falls in love with her. And, and I was trying to say on the board, I was like, he, he's been alone for 200 years. He's, he's not socialized. He doesn't understand how to behave. And, he, you know, he's, he's cruel. But it, it, part of that is because he just doesn't understand his feelings, blah, blah, blah. So I'm trying to make all these apologies. And people just tore me a new one. And maybe that's fair because it's YA and we shouldn't be having that in YA anymore. I don't know. But, like, ever since then, I've been, like, very hard on myself. Like, no, I'm bad. Everybody said I was bad. It sounds like a lot of people who are, jer I mean, jerks on the internet. <laughs> Imagine. No, Imagine remember what that. we always say. We don't, we don't shit on other people's fandoms, right? Yeah, like, some of them. if that's your thing, that's your thing. So whatever, a lot of people enjoy that. Not yeah. fine. Well, I come into uh, this and I'm like, yeah, it's going to be so sexy. They're going to hate each other. And then it's not the case. <laughs> um, oh, oh, and I wanted to comment on the costumes. Okay. First. There were some details I really loved in the costumes. The first one, Emma's dresses all button up the back. Harriet's dresses all button up the front. And you know why? Why? Because Emma has someone to help her get dressed and Harriet does not have a, a maid. Oh she has to do it. Oh my God. You're a genius. Yeah. The other thing I really loved is there's a scene when nightly is walking out of his house and chatting with maybe robert martin i think i don't know he's like chatting with someone i'm thinking oh gosh you know his jacket is very beautiful but it looks a little faded and first of all it probably was faded because they repurpose costumes for these all the times right the imdb trivia of this show is basically all that dress was in this production <laughs> this dress was in that production um but I love, like, people, it wouldn't always have been perfect and beautiful and new. And you don't wear a new dress in every scene or a new jack coat in every scene. Right. It was so velvet, but it was, like, a little faded because he'd probably been wearing the same coat for a couple and of years. And he doesn't care. Knightley's not a dandy. Knightley is. Yeah, he yeah. doesn't give a fuck. <laughs> uh, the third thing is not costume related, but it is set dressing related. I loved it when they showed the interior of his house. I oh, mean, my God, Yes. It was so bachelor, like I could, it was all dark wood paneling and like dark color. It was just like bachelor hunting lodge. Oh, and he, he, lived, saw he and his brother lived there by themselves and his brother got married. You know what I mean? Like it was so <laughs> different from 
what is their house called? Heart, no, Heart Hartfield. Hartfield. It was so different from Hartfield, which is always the doors are open. There's always sunshine streaming in. Everything is bright. There's flowers everywhere. And you're thinking to yourself when you see it, like Emma would shrivel up and die here, which is why when he's like, I've been thinking about it, we'll stay at Hartfield or whatever it is. You're like, yes, yes. Yeah. And, and yeah, even yeah, when they're at like, Donwell, there's a scene where they're at Donwell and he says something to her, like, you could be mistress of this house, you know, like she presides wherever she is or whatever. Yeah. But then you see this massive house behind them in the distance when he's saying this and you're like, that is the least cozy place that yeah. I can imagine be. And so you're very not. glad he decides to move into Hartfield and to, to have this sort of, but did you see what was written um, there's a scene where he goes out in the morning and behind him, uh, behind in the doorway, there's a Latin phrase written over the door, sed semper amico, which um, I, I did take Latin. I just had to brush up a little bit. And it means, always. But, but always for a friend, which is like Aww. the second part of a, like envy is never at welcome here, but always for a friend or something. I was Googling it. I, I came across a blog called Jane Austen in Vermont, which is where I learned that it's, it's been on several country homes and, oh. but always for a friend, but how beautifully does that dovetail with the, the theme of my wonderful darling friend, you know, that they're, they're, they're moving from this, friend to lover relationship and the emphasis is on their friendship and like even when she said in the beginning oh I, I know we shall always be friends so I just thought that was such a beautiful grace note that they left in there um and I just want to say when we're talking about because it takes place in front of his house I thought the funniest part of the whole four hours was when she just bursts in in tears we cannot get married and that is all I have to say and he <laughs> runs out and he's like I've been, I cannot leave my father. And he's like, I've been thinking about it. And I'm, no, it's over. And he's like, Emma. <laughs> I just thought that was like, if you want to make Emma seem kind of girlish and ridiculous, that's the way to do it. Don't have oh, her yeah. be mean. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. And, but, I mean, the part with Box Hill aside, like she's not mean before then. And I felt like they did. Um, but I thought that was the funniest part of the whole thing was when she just busts into his room and he's just like going about his business for the day. <laughs> and she just like, Yeah. No, and and, and he looks feeling. he looks super cute in that scene too, by the way. But yeah. I want to talk, you mentioned about Box Hill, and I want to talk about that too. And to talk about the, the personal growth, because Emma, by the time they're at Box Hill, has already gone through a lot of personal growth with having gone through what she did with Harriet. And I think it's so interesting what they did in this version that I did not feel when she insults Miss Bates, I did not feel like, ooh, Emma is evil because she has a motivation when she's at Box Hill that is very evident that from scenes before and from when they, she's there that she wants to enjoy herself. She's finally made it here. She sees a beautiful view. She wants to be happy. Everyone around her is being a, like a quiet, like introverted jerk. Um, not contributing to the conversation or trying to make it nice, which is kind of rude, by the way. And everyone would, so she wants to have fun. This is really important to her. And so when Frank is the only person who is being sort of lighthearted and happy and saying funny things, she's trying to go along with that because that's the day she wants to have. So when she does make that comment, you get the sense that she walks into this blunder because she immediately sees, oh, seizes on, oh, I'll say a funny thing and doesn't think about the consequence because her, her attention is all drawn to why am I not having fun? I really want to have fun. I really want to make this happen versus just being a snot, right? I, I thought that this version did an excellent job. Well, maybe it was the actor, but Frank, I guess. Oh, Frank, he was great. I thought they did a great job of making him to the audience an asshole, helping you understand why Emma would like him, having it be his impetus that leads her to making that comment and also setting up the awkwardness of that entire scene. Oh my gosh, you're, you're so right. And in, in his early days when he's on the screen, he's fun and you like him. And I honestly felt like, yay, fun's, 
Frank's in this scene. It's going to be fun. And he did this amazing thing where he could turn it on a dime, where all of a sudden he could seem like a real little shit. Like when he arrives at Donwell yeah. and he's so angry and he's so saying all this, like he having this tantrum, you know, and, and men back then were like, especially rich men were like so catered to, you know, that wasn't, that was probably pretty typical of the young spoiled guy to just have this tantrum where he's like, I'm so hot and everything sucks. And he won't, he won't like bring himself back down to be polite to Emma. Okay. And then he immediately switches to you are my best secure and he's so syrupy sweet and you're like whoa this guy is totally freaking me out now and I used to like him and, and, and it's a it, yes you're right and then when he puts his head on her lap mm-hmm. it was very much like a sense of sensibility right yes Greg Wise and like we're gonna be inappropriately close and fun and then I have this sort of secret uh, evilness he even looks a little bit like him actually now that you say that that's amazing what I really liked about and I don't know what the experience would be if you watched this and didn't know that Frank and Jane were engaged but if you are watching it with that it's very clear that the asshole part of his personality ramps up because she's getting like more withdrawn and more upset because of this secret engagement weighing on her he is amping up his asshole behavior as it's wearing on him. Mm-hmm. And he's also doing it to clearly make her jealous, right? Yes. Which is um, such a dick move. And when you, oh yeah. And but when you know that as an audience member, it like makes it if I was just watching it without no, I'd be like, what are their what, what is the their deal? Yeah. You know, but since you know that and you're watching, it's just clearly they're both suffering. And, and, and one they thing just that, express it different ways. Yes, they're both expressing it different ways. And one thing I really appreciate about the length they had with this adaptation, they could do what they want. They kept in the letter scene where he's saying blundered and then Dixon and she's getting madder and madder. Yeah. And they kept in, uh, they kept Donwell, Abby and strawberry picking separate from Box Hill so that he could arrive and be angry and she could, you know, leave and be upset. And actually we got to see Emma being compassionate towards her, which made us like Emma a little bit more, yeah. but yeah. Oh, Oh God. And how great was it when nightly observes the letters? I love this scene in the book and I love it even more in the movie because he is watching Frank and Jane, he sees Dixon and blundered and he's like, what the heck is going on with these people? And he tries to tell Emma, but the best thing about this movie is he says it and he says it in such an awkward way. He's like, I've noticed secret looks and she is like secret looks (laughs) and is totally dying that he's doing the matchmaker thing is totally dying because it seems for a moment as if he's feeling and looking really silly i mean even though he's right he's the best matchmaker of everybody he's the only one who sees what's really going it out and he's not even trying he's not even trying he's just actually observing people and not letting his fancy run away with them right but oh she dies secret looks and i laughed so hard it was so So in terms of Jane Fairfax, I mean, they're kind of hamstrung because let's be honest, and this was very, to me, this seemed pretty close to her in the books where she doesn't really do much. She just kind of seems sickly, or at least everyone says she's sick all the time. I mean, she's clearly super depressed, right? Right. I did. So that means she doesn't have much of a personality. However, the scene where she tells Emma, like, no, I'm walking. And then the scene where she finally stands up to Mrs. Alton, I was like, you go, girl. (laughs) And she's like, no, I will not give up my, I will not inconvenience your servant and I will not give up my walk to the post office. And it was like, finally show some backbone. Yeah. and I I I I was very emotional. I was very into this Jane Fairfax, the way they were portraying her. It's definitely a departure from the books, too. I don't think the books Jane Fairfax gets a chance to really show that backbone. They Which is of- why you're just kind of like, about her, I think. <laughs> oh, oh, but then I love the scene at the end where the aunt dies and she is in, like, she's walking and Frank comes running up and he grabs her and he swings her around and they smooch, which would never happen. But they're both so finally happy and they actually can be themselves. Yeah, yeah. And you and feel like, oh, they're actually like really lovely people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you really feel happy for them, which makes you just like, every, along with everybody else in the story, forgive him. Yeah, he's so uh, more nice than he after deserves. that. He yeah. apologizes and he's like so friendly and he's no longer a total dick. <laughs> and it's like, 
Oh, well, thank God. Cause if they, they, they never give you that moment in the movie. I don't think so. Like you never see him actually just be a nice guy. No, um, like in the Gwyneth version, he, I mean, he doesn't even appear after they. Yeah. And also them. like the hair is so bad. Who oh my God. No, I wrote that in my notes. I was like, excuse me, Frank Churchill does not have a dead animal on his head. I cannot <laughs> accept the validity of this adaptation. <laughs> that is canon. That is canon. Um, but no, it, it, Frank, the Frank Churchill, and let me ask you something costume wise, because when she's waiting for Frank Churchill to come to her for the very first time to meet him, she is wearing an adorable little pocket watch on her dress. Yeah. We don't and, even really see that again, do we? And yeah, we do. We see it in the scene where he leaves, where his aunt dies and he has to go and she's oh. saying goodbye to him. And I, I was like, the first time it appears, I'm like, oh, it's a symbol of how she's, you know, waiting for her life to begin and waiting for this man who she expects to feel something for to arrive. And then maybe the symbolism of the watch again is like she's expecting to feel this way. She's waiting for some sort of like change in her feelings for him or for him to propose. And she's so wide eyed and almost frightened in that scene. Uh, that he's going he's to propose, propose to her. Yeah, yeah, she's out of her element. You know, it's time. It's time for her to grow in some way. And then it doesn't happen. But I went back and I read the scene in the book. And the scene in the book does not have the same kind of depth, does not emphasize her mm -hmm. unsureness and her youngness. And so that really made me appreciate this adaptation and is giving her more likability, where she's mm -hmm. sort of cool as a cucumber in the book. And, I, you know, like, sorry to be like use a cliche, but she's she's sort of more cool. And I don't get as invested in yeah. her her feelings. Um I think they walked through when I was watching that scene too. And I said, this was like me for the entire year before you asked me to marry you where like, it was a bomb that could have gone off <laughs> any time. And, any moment. and I was just like, is this it? Is this it? Is it finally <laughs> happening? Yeah. Oh my God. That's so funny. Sorry. I'm just jumping from things to things. You want to, okay. I, I'm ready to tell you how right you are and how wrong I am. Oh, okay. Please proceed. Oh, oh, is this about Michael Gambon? It absolutely is Yay, about Michael Gambon. Because yeah. I loved him in this. Kristen and I had some words exchanged on Facebook and in text because I loved him in this. Any, it's a one dimensional character. Yeah, but I mean, he's written that way. And I thought that he just really brought a certain like delightfulness to the character. All right, go. Tell me I'm right. He took it and he made it his own thing. Okay, so. It's, he's different than Mr. Woodhouse in the books. He is not Mr. Woodhouse from the books. And, you know, he should have been a little bit more frail, a little bit more lovable and helpless. Mm -hmm. And that's what I was expecting and wanting. And when Michael Gambon presented it, he presented it in a judgmental, irritable way where he's like, why are they doing this? Oh, Knightley's always here, which I was really surprised. Like, Knightley's always here. Why can't we just have uh, Isabella and the children to ourselves I'm talking about John Knightley? And I'm like, what? This is not in the book. In the book, he loves Mr. Knightley. They're friends. And so every time it departed from what I thought it would be, I made a note about it, and I thought, this is bad. This is wrong. However, I was unfair because he did make the character something funny funnier. Mm -hmm. he, he, yeah. by the, by, at the beginning, I was like, why is this guy an asshole? He's so irritable. As he went on and on, it became more ridiculous and more funny. Like when he comes to Donald, he's like, we hate being in other people's houses. Yeah. And yeah. Even, <laughs> even though I was like, what an asshole, I still was like, oh, okay, that's pretty funny. And then, then his anxiety. Okay. So people who have anxiety and people who are difficult to deal with because they have anxiety. When you realize why they're behaving the way that they do, it's because they're 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 in fear for their loved ones. It totally revolutionizes your way of seeing them. And when this character, and he got to do this a lot in the third and fourth episode, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. was able to actually share his fears and be like, I don't want anything to happen to you. Why are you going to Box Hill? Because something might happen. Something bad could happen at any time. And you totally understand why he feels that way. But, you know, for the uh, untimely death of his wife just made him more like that, right? This is different than the book, but this is tying his quirks to something that really did happen to him. And um, it made me cry at the end when she oh, goes I know away. What you're gonna say. Yes. See, so he doesn't want the wedding to happen. And then she gets married and he's like, is it time? And it's killing him that she's going away for two weeks. Mm -hmm. And it honestly, to see his face, it, it just made me cry. So you're right. He added a depth to that character and they, they wrote it into the script, but he, he starts out like a, he's like, you're like, this guy is a handful. 
And by the end, you're like, I totally understand why he's a handful and I can feel his pain. And there are also funny moments like when he's like, she's like, oh, maybe we'll go to the Coles. And he's like, no, no, with his hands, like, no, I don't want to go. You know, (laughs) he did. And yeah, they play it for laughs in the beginning. But there's two scenes in particular that he just brings like, I don't know, you have such pathos for that character when she and Knightley walk in having just, they're going to go tell him. And the way they shot it was, you can see Knightley reaches around and takes Emma's hands, which are clasped behind her yeah. back. But you can see his face. He's like tending the fire and he looks up and sees them. And he smiles. And he smiles because they're here and he likes them. And then he sees what's happening and he becomes afraid. Yeah. And I thought that was, and then the second one is the one you were saying where at the end, it's like the very end is her honeymoon. And you can tell, like, he wants her to be happy. They use the character very to, afraid. to illustrate the closeness of a, an accord of feeling and understanding between Emma and Knightley in a couple of different ways. And one was that I didn't actually, I wrote, why is he such a jerk? So uh, the Knightleys, the John Knightleys, Isabella and the children, they all come to dinner. And that's where they have the Mr. Wingfield, Mr. Perry sort of match where each one is in their own apothecary's corner. Oh, the doctor. Yeah, yeah, The doctors, the physicians. Um, No, you should have gone to this place. Cromer is better. No, this other place is better. And um, honestly, he was, I I felt that uh, Michael Gambon was not... It should have been a light, lighter feeling scene. It should have been funnier. And then we, then John Knightley is supposed to be the one who like, we're supposed to be afraid of like, no, don't make everything bad. But anyway, they, they didn't quite handle that like the book, but we did get to see George Knightley, you know, Johnny Lee Miller and Emma try to manage the conversation. And yeah. then again, when they are at the Christmas party and John Knightley's like, Oh God, it's snowing. I knew this would happen. And it's so dramatic. And, and George Knightley immediately leaves, comes back. They have this quiet, whispered conversation like, your father will not be easy. Why did not you go? I am ready if the others are. And they sort of manage it to happen. And the only thing I wish they ha- didn't do in that scene, because it's such a quiet, lovely scene in the book, is that they have them needle each other when um, Knightley is like, well, I'll call the carriages, right? Because earlier... And this is another thing that makes her seem so childish. She had been like, you arrived like a gentleman, you know, you should arrive like a gentleman in your carriage, you know, and it's, he's like nonsensical girl, you know. That is, that is not my, so my take remembrance of that scene, it starts to snow, everyone's freaking out. (laughs) She runs to the door because she's going to call for the carriage. He comes in and he says, look, I've already ridden down the lane. Everything's going to be fine. It's not even half an inch deep. And then he like yells into the room, everyone will be fine. Everyone will be able to get home. Everything's okay. And then doesn't he say that like, I will go get the carriages. See, to me, I didn't take it as like a dig back at her. I just took it as him being like doing, and she looks grateful. She makes a little face. I I made a note. I'm like, this is not the time when they should be needling each other. Cause this is supposed to be a nice, maybe maybe I misunderstood. Maybe I misunderstood. She was just, he had like already in, like in the book, he'd already anticipated that her dad would be upset and he had already like taken. No, he steps. still does a nice thing. I mean, that's still yeah. a very sweet thing that he did. I just felt like, yeah, but no, maybe I need to watch it again. Yeah, too. You but just can't I was cut John still, Lee Miller a break. I know I really should. Maybe that's because I still wasn't cutting him a break. And I was still uh, like, I hate everything. Everything's different. There is something very important that we need to discuss that we have not discussed. What's that? There are two Edmund Bertrams in this movie. Oh my God. <laughs> I was watching it and I texted Kristen. I'm like, um, excuse me, Edmund Bertram has wandered over from Mansfield Park. <laughs> neighboring Mansfield Park. Because Mr. Elton is totally played by the same dude. Yeah. Who was Edmund? And Johnny Lee Miller was Edmund Bertram. Don't even get me started. So this whole fucking movie is just full of Edmund Bertrams. Like, part do you think of they my... talk about that at all? Yeah, I don't know. I'm sure like other people have have mentioned it, but or like on set, like, oh, hey, yeah, I was Edmund too. (laughs) (laughs) I was. They're clearly thinking I was the better Edmund. No, I was the better Edmund. I was happy to see. I was happy to see that guy because he got to be funny in this one. Yeah, Edmund is kind of like a. Yeah, Um, yeah. that's my. (laughs) That's the literary term. 
uh, but he got to like have some funny moments here. And he so did. I thought that was good for him. He did well as Elton. He did. He did some funny mugging, you know, like extra, you know, like gall- gallant and like appropriate over the level top. of slimy. Yeah. Yet funny. Although, I mean, okay. He was very good, but Alan Cumming. I know oh there's no substitute. I mean, you're not yes, gonna in the in the proposal scene when they're in the carriage and Elton is proposing to her. I did write that. I'm like, this is very. He's doing a great job. However, there is no yeah. Alan Cumming. Like, there is no substitute. But anyway, he's still and he honestly he's handsomer, I think, than Alan Cumming. So he's maybe a more believable mm. guy who thinks he can seduce whatever woman who comes along, kind of thing. I thought Mrs. Elton did a, a totally fine job. Uh, oh, okay. So I really like that actress. She was in a show called Hex, which was Michael Fassbender's like first big role where he played a fallen angel and she was like the descendant of witches at a girl's, at a, not a girl's school, but at, like a co-ed private school in England. And he was trying to corrupt her. So she'd set him free, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, I've always really liked that actress. Um, so I was happy to see her here. I thought she did a great job. Her styling, by the way, was amazing. Yeah. How they always made her dresses and hats look. Yes. And then she got to, she got to keep the line. I have a great horror of finery from the book, which is, yeah, like, which of is perfect. Over. Yeah. 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 You know, one um, of the things where this movie sort of sometimes got it wrong for me is it was too heavy handed almost with, um, there's one scene with Elton and Mrs. Elton sitting next to each other and somebody says something that they don't like. I think Emma says something about not, not going to Bath or something. And any, everyone can obviously hear them. No one else is speaking. And he whispers to her, people are very unsophisticated here, my love. And uh, she's like, yes, quite very unsophisticated. Oh, that they're just so obviously but like rude. Nobody would really do that. Like no one, especially not back then, it's such so blatantly impolite and there was another scene too where they're like very loud whispering right next to a person and we're supposed to believe that, you know, I don't know. It was too, it was not realistic as how you would normally, no matter how small you are, you know, it would have been better if they had found some other ways to slide each other in more backhanded ways. Like you would have to do in the era. Or at least a little more sotto voce. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Sotto voce. Or um, I don't know. I feel like they, they they did a very heavy hand. I hate it when people are like, okay, we hate this character now. And so they make the character say lines that are so outsized, ridiculous of what people do. Oh, and another kind of heavy handed, possibly inappropriate thing is when Harriet first learns that Mr. Elton has been engaged and Knightley comes in with the news, whatever. Some other people are sitting around and Harriet bursts into tears and sobs on the couch. That would have been totally not okay. I think in the, in the real setting, she would have had to get up and leave the room because letting people see your grief like that was just sort of a not done thing. And it still kind of is not if you're amongst, you know, a, a party of people who are so friends, but not like besties. You know what I mean? Yeah. I thought that Harriet was not well utilized as a character in this adaptation. And maybe it's just because Tony Collette is so amazing <laughs> because she is mm-hmm. that you just really, you, you just love her in the movie. And yeah. this, I think it was just, they seemed, the writers almost seemed like uninterested in her she did kind of disappear as a friend to Emma in episode yeah, three. Yeah, she four. never was the. She never had anything other than to like be one of Emma's dolls. Like it's not yeah, just yeah. Emma who treated her that way. It is also the writers. Oh yeah, that's true. And, and like Tony Collette is so great. Like yeah. So there's... it would have been, but the relationship between those two characters, I thought, was much more believable and fun in the movie yeah she disappeared for like a whole episode (laughs) i thought the friendship between harriet and emma was more believable in this than in the gwyneth one because emma also is portrayed as so much younger than gwyneth is portrayed that um that's true sort of a young girly friendship sort of like a Catherine morland isabella thorpe kind of thing where they're like uh, corrupting each other um i mean You know what I mean, though. Like, uh, they're they're two sort of young, very I don't want to say airheaded, but but they they their understanding of life is both a little warped. So that is true. That it, is a good point, and that is true. But I still just never really. I just didn't. They, they didn't not. have chemistry for you, is what yeah, you're saying. I don't they even know if it's that. I think it's just more her place in the story. Mm. It was like filler. 
if they're going to forget about her for like an hour, it is like, <laughs> what's the point? What were your thoughts on, because we did have so much more time, we had four hours for this version. Um, having Isabella and John Knightley be more present. I loved it. And I loved their casting of John Knightley. I thought his line reads were great. I thought the character was very similar to what it was in the book. And it was comic relief in a lot, in a lot of places. It's kind of curmudgeonly. Yeah. 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 I, I, re I really enjoyed how he got to tell Emma, you know, Elton likes you. And Emma got to be like, okay, dude, you have no idea what you're talking about. And, and then like, to uh -huh, be irritated. Yeah, okay, talk to me in right. an hour. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I got to, I enjoyed how he got to complain, you know, in the, in the normal book, he's like complaining, sort of like a Mr. Woodhouse. Like I hate going to other people's, you know, and like freaking yeah. out about this now. He was a good comic relief. I think he filled a comic relief slot that we sort of were let down on with um, Miss Bates, who was not to me she my was favorite. She not as, um, I thought the actress was great. I thought the way that her line readings and her everything was great. I, they just didn't use her a lot. Well, the thing is, I didn't like her line readings. They seemed huh. so robotic and flat to me. And I'm like, nobody oh. talks like that. You know I what I mean? It, it sounded like just like when I was reading it in my own brain. Oh, really? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> um, I did love at the end where she's like, mother found her voice. And now she like, can't railroad her mom all the time. <laughs> and she was just like, oh, great. Now my mom can talk back. It was so funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and I mean, she, she, she did fine. She did fine. Oh my God. Did it make me cry when, um, so after the big insult at Box Hill, after Johnny Lee Miller gets his badly done and, and, you know, Emma really feels it. And that, that scene was okay. was okay for me. It was I just hated okay. The shaky cam. I hated the shaky cam. Oh yeah. I they only hate utilized cam. shaky cam and maybe like three or four scenes in this entire four hour thing. And they were always like, these are big emotional yeah. moments. And I was just like, oh, uh, stop awful. shoving the shaky cam down our throats. Yeah. What is this persuasion? Get that thing out of here. <laughs> <laughs> but no, but, but the, um, the, she does the insult. She gets chastised. She goes the next morning to Miss Bates house and she's looking around in the town. She's in the square. Everyone. And I think this is her imagining yeah, but everyone is staring at her, and one woman opens her umbrella to like block the it sight her of face. her. Like, and she's like, "I am a monster." Um, you know, Knightley really made her feel like she was a monster. I mean, that was the effect of his big outburst, and of course, and so she goes, and it's like the walk to the gallows, essentially. You know, it's like, "Oh my god, I got to do this, and it's going to be so hard." She a baguette, though. She brought a really nice baguette. I know a baguette. It's so nice. But I loved what they did with the character and the styling too, because they did a totally no makeup face. Yeah, in her fact, hair they, was such a mess. They do, I believe, they do full on no makeup from the time Knightley in, in tells her that she did a bad thing. Um, because I noticed she was looking very like pale, wan, washed out. Obviously, she's living with the knowledge that Knightley might marry Harriet and she's really having a hard time with that. But anyway, and her hair is sort of un untidy, and she it looked like she just stairs. kind of put it up herself in like a twist tie or something. I like that. Yeah, and when she's sitting myself, in the base, is probably what most people looked like. Oh yeah, totally. Time, for I real. <laughs> but no, I have to laugh. At, I'll tell you more about that in a second. But she's sitting in the Bates's parlor and she's trying to apologize, but she's not coming. She can't, she's not going to come out and do it directly and acknowledge that it happened. So she's saying all these nice things about Jane and I then Miss Bates too. actually starts to cry because of how nice she's being. And she leans forward and Ramona Rai's face is just a study and just being devastated by what she's done and trying so hard to repair the relationship and her, her, her lips sort of um, uh, trembles a little bit. And she's like, you know, we, we're all at your disposal. We all want the best for you and everything. And honestly, I cried like it was the actress was so affecting in that scene. Both of them were. So that's one, one scene where Miss Bates did a, a really good job for me anyway, in being, being herself. And, you know, you're sitting there and, and, they, they, you expect them to do what the same thing they did in the Gwyneth adaptation, which is for Miss Bates to hide from Emma because she's so hurt. But she doesn't do that. She, she is her old, you know, self, and she's bounced back, which is what Miss Bates would do. So you're feeling the character too, like, oh man, you must be suffering inside. But you're going to be the same polite person you always are, 
I just love that duality of it. Um, but yeah, so so Emma wears no makeup and she's not wearing any makeup um, when, um, I mean, she wouldn't have been in real life, but we're talking about like the styling of her mulligar eye. I mean, you want her to have a little blush. You want her to look young and these pink lips. When Johnny Lee Miller comes home, when Miss George Knightley comes home from London to say, time will heal, you, heal your wound. First of all, it's hysterical how she hides behind a bush. Oh, yeah. And she's like, she's been a naughty child. And she says, are you going to scold me? You have a look yeah. about me. Like, oh, it's so cute. Just like, so it's a callback to their earlier days together. I and then what the did you think about episode. this? She has to step over a hedge. What did you think about that? I didn't notice it. Oh, did yeah. Did she like, fall down the ha-ha? <laughs> <laughs> no, she's hiding behind a bush. And he's like, come here. And she has oh, yeah. to step over a low hedge in order to get to him. And Kevin's like, why didn't they just film the scene with a hedge that had an opening right there. It wasn't funny to see her have to climb over the hedge. I, well, I kind of, I was like, I wrote, I was like, are they doing a metaphor thing here? You oh, know, like, I don't, I don't know. It's just funny. It's supposed to be like, she's so off balance. Oh, that's she's true. She's so upset. Like, she's just, she just is like, but so then not they, herself. Then they do the thing where she's, she, he says, I want to tell you my secret. And she's like, no, do not tell me. And he walks away. Well, at that point he walks onto the lawn and away from the ordered beautiful garden. And she they're follows off him. the path now. Kristen, they're, they're exactly. in unfamiliar territory. <laughs> so I was like, no, that's an interesting choice. And then they do this beautiful thing where she's like, can this be true? And, and she puts trembling hands on his face. Mm -hmm. And then kisses him. And he doesn't raise his arm up. Like, he's like, what's happening? I mean, it's also new for both of them that it was a totally beautiful scene. But then, of course, the next scene they cut to when they're sitting together on the um, they're on a little bench overlooking Hartfield, I was like, oh, the lip gloss is back, right? Then she had some rosiness to her. She had some and roses in her she cheek. <laughs> face and that, okay, I love this whole final episode, by the way. Yes. When she t reaches up to touch his face while they're sitting on the bench, her hands looked so tiny. <laughs> it was like someone had taken a little Barbie hand. <laughs> you know how there's like that website where they replace everyone's hands with little baby doll hands? Yeah, it, really, it was like just that. like that. It was like this tiny little hand extends and touches <laughs> his face. <laughs> anyway, I loved that whole scene because it was very close to the book where it's like this double talk. There's mm -hmm. a lot of like the scene with her and Harriet where Harriet is saying, oh, I have to tell you who I'm in love with now. It's like, we shall not speak of him. Yeah. And like, she's talking about Knightley and Emma's talking about Churchill. And it's a comedy of miscommunication and errors. And it's like that. And I usually hate that, but I thought it worked really well in this. Yes, I usually hate it too. And and even in the book, it's like, why wouldn't you just say his name, you know? And um, I thought it worked really well too. Is it as a marker of restraint, yeah. You know, I am going to say I really loved the third and fourth, the back half of this adaptation. I oh, yeah. I think it did a great job of capturing kind of Austin's satire, the ridiculousness oh, of ugh. the people and the situations. It, it made us more it invested. Very, it played it very straight. Yeah. And there were times where the actors brought it in, like Michael Gambon, I think, is a good example. But I just missed that kind of, I don't know, it's such an amorphous quality. But I felt like, again, like, oh, what a Paltrow version. But something it did really well was just kind of capture that bite, like okay. Austin's use of the, her satire and her absurdity. Mm. <laughs> I thought it really got that. And I can think of a couple examples off the top of my head. With this one, I can't really come up with that many. The one where she runs into his, I can't ever marry you. That's it forever. <laughs> you know, like that's kind of a good example, but there were few and far between. You know, only in the first two episodes. Mrs. Elton was underutilized as a source of that kind of satire of human nature. They made her more just nasty. Yeah. Than like actually, I mean, the joke is she thinks she's the most worldly and smartest and best traveled and, sophisticated and she's not right. And they kind of, with the costuming, they kind of got that across, but they right. just really made her nasty she rather doesn't, than speaking validation. Yes. She doesn't go on and on and on about Maple Grove, for example. She doesn't get that, that awesome scene that Juliet Stevenson gets in the Gwyneth Emma 
where she's walking along and is saying, we should simply adopt Jane Fairfax and you should do it with me. And you all know the lines of the poet, fall many a flower is born to blush on sea. You know, like yeah. there's so much more Mrs. Elton and Emma um, clashing and secretly Who's hating each other. Who's going to be the top? Who's yeah, the who's the, exact, yeah. Exactly, exactly. And I just like that to me is not very interesting because I don't know. It's just, it's more fun to have her be an absurd character yeah. than have her be a cruel one. Yeah. So I there's agree. just like little points like that where I thought were kind of, and again, what you were saying with Miss Bates, like Miss Bates is ridiculous. And, but I, I really love Knightley's defense of her in the book and in all of the versions, but here she was just kind of underutilized, so she yeah. didn't fill that role either. That's true. I think you're I hitting know. on a good point. I think you're hitting on they went maybe went away from the extended laugh scenes and ridiculous na- human nature scenes in order to focus on character, the character of Emma and the character growth of Emma and the drama of of what's going on with her. So that is understandable. I think they they had to pick a focus. But I will never lose my the place in my heart for the Gwyneth movie. And and let me tell you too. The scene in the first episode where Johnny Lee Miller ha- says his big fight and it says, you you know, you will regret your meddling. You're playing with these people like doll- dolls, Ree Harriet and Robert Martin. The beautiful comedy of that scene in the Gwyneth one where they're shooting the arrows is just absolutely charming. And it's a much lighter feel. So you know that they are still irritated with each other. With each other. You do still understand the content of their fight and why it's important and that Emma is playing with lives. But at the same time, at each other. you get, you get Jeremy Northam looking nettled, not furious. You get him saying like, um, you know, better be without sense than misapply it as you do rather than you will regret your meddling. You will regret it, you know, and, and the lightness of it, the, the frothy confection of it is in the Gwyneth one and the real understanding of the, the growth of this young girl is in the Romola one. So I think that they can still both, it, we don't have to have a cage match, you know, they are no, no, two no, no, totally no, no. different. I just, I miss that this version did not take it I mean that's Austin's genius and I felt like yes it was not present as much yes yes in this version and that seemed like a real missed opportunity and again like when you compile that with these kind of structural issues I had at least in the first couple episodes it was just like oh like I think if I watched it again I I'm definitely gonna watch three and four again well, and well, here's the high praise. Here's the very high praise I can give this version is like when Austin said, I've written heroin, which I fear no one but myself will much like. I always felt that's true. I don't like the book, Emma. I don't like the Gwyneth Emma. And now that has changed for me because of the way the window this adaptation showed me into this character. Oh, I liked the book, Emma. Yeah, eh, I like I her know. more than I like uh, this one for the first two episodes. And probably that's been influenced by Gwyneth. You know, I saw Gwyneth first before I read the book, so probably... Oh, God, no. Why does Gwyneth ruin everything? <laughs> uh, first, she has to, like, color your perception of Emma. Then she has to, like, destroy all of humanity with her pig flu or whatever. <laughs> Thanks, Gwyneth. <laughs> That's a, uh, that's what, um, what is that movie? It's Contagion. Not Contagion. Yeah. That's a Contagion spoiler. Sorry. Yeah. And then she did uh, goop. And then oh, she, and then she goop. has a, everyone shoving like marble eggs up their hoo-ha. Oh, yeah. Up their ha-ha. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, no. Yeah. She's, that that, she's, 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 her, her impact on this world has, um, has mixed reviews, I think. <laughs> but I, I still love that version. It's still delightful. So. Oh, it is. And. I, like I said, when I figured out what they were doing, like, oh, Highbury is supposed to be like very country and these people are, not which kind of makes the Mrs. Elton thing. It also doesn't work because she is probably one of the more sophisticated people. Right. But then right. she's, and she, so it's makes it even meaner because when she says these things to them, like they're true. And so that makes it like even meaner. Yeah. Whereas in the, the movie version, like they're stunningly beautiful estates and they are very rich. And so when she comes in and saying that she's the um, arbiter of taste, it's like, okay, bitch, whatever. Here, it's like, well, they are super backward and th- not backward, but you know what I'm saying. It's kind of like the take that the Kira Knightley Pride and Prejudice took where they're like, we're going to make it really like crunchy and earthy and yeah, show yeah. them as not being wealthy. Right. And make it the darker version. 
So, yeah, so that, those are all my, like, major notes. Did you have anything else you wanted to? No, I have said all of my thoughts. Awesome. Mostly well, we... as they occurred. <laughs> Would you like to go to the weed sheet? <gasps> Let's go to the weed sheet. We, much like we have a theme song for our podcast, <laughs> maybe we should come up with a little tune to play when we skip down the lane. I will not sacrifice my walks to the wheat sheath. <laughs> I will not inconvenience your servant. <laughs> okay, Jane Fairfax. Okay. Um, no, if I was Jane Fairfax, I would just like sit here quietly, look pale yeah. and tragic. Arrange your skirts and now look pale. Oh God, but how did Frank was even a dick at the dance? He was like, her hair looks terrible. Like, okay, I'll get over. I can't get over how awful he is. He but he okay. really was. Like, remember when I was the big Frank Churchill apologist in the book? Yeah. Like, he really was a dick in this one until yeah, the end. And then he was lovely and so affable and charming. But for most of it, he was like, ugh. Uh, okay, so we are at the wheat sheep. So uh, we had a lovely email from listener Alex um, in the UK. And she wrote some questions with, and some of them are with regard to Emma. Oh, I love answering questions. Yeah. So the first one actually is not with regard to Emma, but it's a really good one. So she wonders what heroes and heroines of Austin's novels were sexually active before marriage? Yeah, that's a good question, isn't it? Yes, it's a good question. So I wrote, I wrote her back with a list. I don't know if you have uh, thoughts on this, but here is what I said. I said, um, you know, Austin was certainly aware of such goings on in her own world, but as these men exist as fantasy men and mostly very good men, we can judge them as the story presents them to us. But I still think even within these stories, some of them are more likely to have been previously sexually active than others. Every man except Edmund Bertram. Well, no, I don't know. I, feel that Darcy and Tilney were not totally active. you think they were active oh hell yes <laughs> I don't know I think there's something in them they are so no no they're so no. good they're so Kristen, essentially good at heart uh -uh. yeah they can still be good guys but how many Darcy, like uh tavern wenches are there come on I mean, Darcy thinks of himself as this temple of purity and goodness that he can look down on everybody else, right? Like, he's too good. I think good. it's really sweet that you feel that way. I, yeah, I don't know. For some reason, if anybody is likely to be, my guess are Tar Darcy and Tilney. They're so good at heart. But it's so I funny think, because they are my least likely. I think burning. that um, Knightley is just way too worldly to not have had at least one experience I think he must have. I mean, he's so, he's what, is he almost 40? He's been master of his own estate for so many years. He's been raised in all this privilege. He's worldly wise. I think he has to have had at least one. And he had an older brother. Right. And I think Brandon obviously was sexually active, um, likely with Eliza, but maybe, maybe not. But then when he went Ooh. to India, okay. you know, I mean, he's just far too old to have not. <laughs> no, you know what I mean? I think Bingley was definitely sexually active. You know, there's all this reference in Pride and Prejudice to him being in love before. Mm -hmm. you, are you on board with Bingley? Yeah, I said, mm -hmm. I told you, everyone but Edmund Bertram. <laughs> and I think Wentworth being so worldly and being out in the world and being in all this danger and having done been in action, I think it's highly likely that he was. I also think they all had STIs. <laughs> no, British Jewish <laughs> sailors. And Edward Ferrers, I actually say yes. I mean, he's so, so shy. But I think with Lucy, he totally was drawn in. And I think it's highly likely that he did something with Lucy. That's obviously, probably how she got him. That obvious, yeah, exactly. Obviously, Henry Crawford. Um, and I'm saying Edmund Bertram, I'll leave as a toss-up. No. Because... He's, he was okay, he's a goody goody and he was going to be in the clergy. Yes, but he's such a good goody. But he seems to be a little blind where his own morality is concerned. He seems to be willing to make excuses for himself. I think he he is more bet okay, flexible. But Kristen, it's one thing to like talk yourself into being in a like one act play with a girl you think is cute than to like. Uh, he's constantly talking. I mean, I was saying, he's constantly talking, but he's talking about being drunk in Oxford all the time. Okay. You know, they all had these double standards where if it's with a, you know, like a, a person of a lower sexual class. experience with a woman. 
It's true. It's true. Well, I could totally see Henry Crawford as bisexual. Totally. Totally. Okay. Totally. So we're we're on we're on the same. Um, I mean, there is a there's a little bit of a something between Darcy and Bingley. Like, I'm not saying they had sex, but there's a there's a like there's a, a latent, bromance. There's a latent bromance. Yeah. Okay. And I so, say it's more of like a big brother, little brother, because Bingley definitely has a little some bit of hero love. worship. There is yeah. some love. I'm I'm sticking to my original assessment that all of them, except for maybe Edmund Bertram, but all of them. Yeah, totally. I it's think any man really. back then of means, because they're all men of means, right? Yes. Yep. Well, and, and honestly, and there's a, there's a coder to this question. Do you think it possible that Austin could have, had, have alluded to having had a past in the sense, or, oh, actually, oh, her question what? was, did Austin allude to these people having a past? Uh, but I didn't answer that question because I just realized that's what it said. I well, thought I she was asking about that a little bit. I thought she was asking, did Austin herself have? Oh no, I think she meant in the novels. Did she? Yes, that's what she that? meant. But I, when I first responded to her question, I thought Austin herself. And I think that it's impossible to say, obviously. But there's one passage in Mansfield Park when um, Edmund takes Mary Crawford's arm. And he feels the connection for the first time, that physical connection. Yeah. I don't think you would write that unless you yourself knew what it was to touch or be touched in some capacity by a member of the opposite sex you had feelings for. So I well, think. Yeah. But I think that that actually supports my theory that he has not had any sexual experience before. Oh, you're right. You're right. But I think it could suggest that Austin herself. Well, I'm, she, I'm sure she'd been attracted to people and had. Oh, yeah. Attention. And I think she probably, you know, like there were probably were probably like like little uh, crushes or people could be said to be sort of in a thing or like little Regency dating, even though they knew they could never be married. Right. Yeah. Um, this is going to be like when you dated someone in sixth grade and yeah, like you yeah, didn't like that. hold their hand. It's like, oh, yeah, we dated for three weeks. <laughs> exactly. And have some like special walks in the forest or whatever. Where you like get some time in with this person you're attracted to. Um, not necessarily. I'm not necessarily implying there is nothing physical, kind of sexual yeah. stuff. But, you know, you want to be close to that per person you have that crush on. So anyway, I think that is likely. Then there's a question about, did we see uh, the 1972 miniseries of Emma? And I have not. I have not either. I didn't even know there was such a thing. Yeah, nor did I. But she did mention that the proposal scene with Knightley in that version is amazing. Hmm. And yeah. And um, the actor who plays Knightley does an amazing job of being um, genuinely surprised that Emma loves him. So when they exchange their feelings. So apparently, you know, that scene at least is worth checking out. So that's it's on YouTube. Know. Yes, it's on it's on YouTube. I'll watch it. Um, yeah, we'll check it out. And then the third question, which is a, definitely an Emma question. Uh, do you think Emma ever told Mr. Knightley about Mr. Elton's proposal after they were married? Yes. Yeah. But I think I think yes. But my thought is she does not tell him right away because well, I think when they first get married, she's afraid of him seeing her as a child. She doesn't want to remind him of her past indiscretions or mistakes. So she keeps that information until she feels more secure and on an equal footing with him. I think. I mean, my experience with marriage in the like month that I've been married, uh, if you, and in the four years we dated before, if you are truly in a partnership with like, they know everything, you tell them everything. I definitely still take steps to hide my idiocy, uh, from Aww, Kevin. Aren't you cute? And then you just tell us on the podcast. Yeah. Well, here's the thing though. I'm always doing the stupidest stuff and he is never doing stupid stuff. I know. Isn't he so perfect? Just I'm always getting funny. dates mixed up or leaving the front door standing wide open or like just totally forgetting an important thing. Today I forgot I, forgot I was podcasting and I was like, oh my God, what am I podcast? You know, like, and, oh and God, we had different. I know. So rude. I just, did I did not I did not forget that we were podcasting on I June know, 1st. I, I just <laughs> forgot that day was the same June 1st as our podcasting June 1st, if May that makes I sense. pause it to you that maybe Kevin is just better at hiding the stupid shit that he does? Well, anymore? he just doesn't act like it's a big deal. But to me, it's a big deal because it's always been like my Achilles heel. And actually, I when I wrote my little YA novel, 
the uh, main character, her, you know, you have to give them like a little character flaw to humanize them. Her flaw is being forgetful. And I'm like, right what you know, you know? (laughs) (laughs) So, so yeah, but I would be, I would not tell him necessarily every stupid mistake that I make. So I don't know. I'm a hundred percent. Not only am I sure that she told him, I am sure that he already knew. Oh yeah. You're, I'm sure. Yeah. You're probably right. You're probably right about that. Yeah. I absolutely love that. And the other thing about Emma too, is she's a very different person from me. As she says in the book, Oh, I always deserve the best treatment because I do not put up with any other. So she mm-hmm. could tell him and then still demand ultimate respect from him. And he would have to respect that because that he knew what he was getting into. He knew who she was. <laughs> He'll just be like, man, I dodged that bullet. Yeah. Didn't I? He'll be like, Oh, Okay, so that's all I had. Should we um, call a day? We should say last call. Anyone going to Jasna? Uh, oh, yeah. So Krista and I will be at Jasna Conference in Williamsburg in October. Yeah, so if you're going, drop us a line, first.impressions.podcast at gmail.com, or you can come on the Facebook page. We were always talk- already talking about it there, but I know we have some listeners who are not on the Facebook page, which is also totally fine. Totally respect I hope somebody, people. I hope somebody who listens does come. That would be really fun to meet people. Yeah. And uh, Devony Lucer is going to be Lozer. It's going to be there, so we can oh, fan cool. girl all over her, which will be amazing. And we're going to go to Regency Murder Mystery, and yes. we're going to do all this awesome stuff. So yeah, I'm really excited. Hopefully but if you're going to go, us will get murdered. Oh, Kristen, you, we'll definitely have to do an episode while we're down there. Oh yeah, we have to do a live episode from from Jasmine 2019. So yeah. So what we if we do like a man on the street thing where we just carry around our microphones <laughs> and interview people? Like, was it Jay Leno that used to do that? Yes, but yeah, I'm sure. Like, um, what are your thoughts on whether Ed, Edmund Bertram was a virgin when he <laughs> married Fanny? Go. So, and then we just like shove the microphone in their face and see what people say. Totally. All right. Well, we'll do that. Well, so without further ado, then I guess we shall say we have delighted you long enough. Bye. Bye.